welcome to the, the, the geek section of the afternoon. Um, it, is, uh, it is about technology, but it's also a lot about uh, psychology, as, as you'll see. So uh, uh, anybody who's watched any of the Barry Schwartz or Dan Gilbert TED presentations is probably uh, going to find this maybe a little bit uh, interesting as well. Search technology on the internet basically works, by any reasonable measure anyways. Whereas decision technology on the internet, so by that I mean the, the car finders on car sites, the house finders on real estate sites, not so much. Decision making on the internet usually involves sifting through long lists of choices, trying to keep a lot of information in your head, and ultimately not being particularly certain that you have in fact made the best uh, choice based on all of this information. And so, uh, like a lot of people who you know, found these tools particularly unhelpful, I started creating my own. Like I said, geek, geek section. Right? These are, so you know, something like this, a decision spreadsheet, where you've got the, you know, the, the features lined up uh, on the side and, the, and your choices across the top. But the problem with these decision spreadsheets is that they don't actually make decisions, right? You still have to pour over all this information and trade off all the features against each other to try and figure out what is your truly best choice, which is why the true geeks among us, and, and again, I, I am their king, uh, will uh, add feature scores to their spreadsheets, right? And so this product gets five on 10 for price, this one gets eight on 10 for brand, and then the spreadsheet adds it all up, and the product with the best score is your best choice, except when it isn't. See, nine times out of 10, I just wouldn't agree that the product with the highest score was in fact my best choice, and I would end up buying something else, which kind of defeated the purpose of the spreadsheet uh, in the first place. And so one day a few years ago, I decided that I was going to solve this problem. I was going to create the mother of all decision-making spreadsheets, a, a model whereby, uh, where it would choose the best possible choice from an array of choices based on all available information, objectively, rationally, and if possible, uh, mathematically. And so because uh, the decision that I was using at, uh, at the time uh, was a decision to buy a car, about which car to buy, I had all sorts of crazy calculations, like 60% of the, the mileage in uh, uh, in liters per 100 kilometers times the number of years in the warranty, except if brand got less than 3 on 10. I mean, it was, it was beautiful. <laughs> and then I loaded it up with all of this product information about the dozen or so cars that I was considering. And uh, this, you know, computer shook, smoke curled out of the vents, and it produced a result. The truly best choice, objectively, rationally, and mathematically speaking. And I looked at that choice and said, I don't think so. And it just seemed that no matter how much I worked on this spreadsheet, I never actually agreed with the choices, the decisions that it was recommending, which is kind of strange because I was the person who created the spreadsheet in the first place. But then one day I was actually in a car dealership and I was looking at a, a feature sheet uh, printed on the side of a car and I saw 150 horsepower and I thought, oh, well, that's, that's pretty good. And I guess the, the shopper beside me overheard me because he saw 150 horsepower and said, yuck, that sucks. But this kind of got me thinking that if I had to somehow prove to this guy that 150 horsepower was a good horsepower rating for a car in this class, objectively speaking, I couldn't really think of a way of doing it. And then I began to realize that 150 horsepower, or, or, or any feature for that matter, isn't objectively good or bad because it isn't objectively anything. It's just a number, can't be. What makes it good or bad, in fact, the only thing that makes it good or bad is a given individual's emotional responses to it. And so anybody with a background in psychology or maybe even philosophy may be thinking that this is kind of obvious. But if you've ever gotten into an argument with somebody about what the best cell phone is on the market or what the best cappuccino machine is, then you haven't truly sort of internalized or assimilated this fact that you might as well be arguing about what the other person's favorite color should be. It's entirely subjective. Now, as a, as a car carrying nerd myself, I was very uncomfortable with this whole sort of you know, subjective, touchy-feely, kind of new age sounding approach. But the more I worked on my spreadsheet, the more inescapable this conclusion became, which is that even the hardest core geek, you know, shopping for a laptop and looking at features like number of USB ports and processor speed is still making that decision based entirely on their emotional responses to those features, even if they consider that they are using quote unquote objective criteria. So then I went back to my spreadsheet and I immediately saw my mistake, which was, what I, uh, which was that I was trying to use calculations to figure out what features were good and what features were bad, but of course, that wasn't working. Somehow, in order to be truly helpful to me, the spreadsheet had to understand how I, as an individual, respond emotionally to features. Now, 
explaining one's emotional responses to horsepower or, or horsepower ratings to a computer might sound kind of tricky, but actually damn near friggin' impossible. You see, I started with the kind of thing that you normally see on shopping sites, right? And so using an interface like this, I can say things like 139 horsepower would be absolutely out of the question, but 140 would be just fine. And I feel exactly the same about everything from 140 right up through to 180. Oh, and by the way, if there's a car that's better than what I'm expecting out there, you know, maybe 185 horsepower, somehow I don't want to know about that. And so while this does make a great deal of sense to databases, it doesn't make any sense to human beings. It's not the way anybody actually thinks about features. And so I started trying all of these different ways of, uh, of explaining how I really felt about these different uh, decision factors to the computer. But for everyone, I could always think of ways that I could feel that it wouldn't understand using uh, this interface. And so I began to think that maybe this is just impossible, right? That computers are simply not able to understand the vagaries of our emotional responses. But then I thought back to my experience in the car dealership and I thought, you know, what, what came out of that? We had yuck and nice. And through playing around with these other uh, types of interfaces, I realized that the notion of unacceptable had to be in there somewhere because there were features that were out of the question. And uh, there were also features that didn't really affect my decision one way or another. And of course, features that were mind-blowingly awesome. So that had to be in there somewhere too. So I started playing around with this kind of random bag of, of words and phrases. And I ended up lining them up from most negative sounding to most positive sounding. And then I tried it by putting some representative horsepower ratings below it. And for the first time, I was able to say yes, that. That is exactly how I feel about horsepower ratings. 110 would be out of the question, 130, maybe, if the other features are really awesome. 150, pretty much what I'm expecting. 170, kind of a bonus. 190, sure, but not much more than 170. And this is exactly how I felt about brand and price. You know, it even worked for features like aesthetic design, right? In fact, it worked for every feature of every product. In fact, any factor of any decision that I could think of. And if you're still wondering why this represents uh, emotional information, consider that this is basically a different version of the same interface. <laughs> Right? These, these are essentially dopamine responses. So then uh, the process, so then I was able to, uh, to take this emotional information and combine it with raw product information into a ranked list. And I always agreed that the product that was at the top of the list, the choice that was the top ranked uh, in this list, was actually my best choice, was the one that I would actually buy. And uh, later on, I added a little uh, feature to this where uh, it would actually automatically show me the things that I was going to like and not like about that choice so I could really understand why this was my best choice uh, as well. So since then, I bought the perfect laptop for me, the perfect washing machine for me, the perfect car for me, you know, about at least 20 other decisions. How do I know that those were the absolutely best choices that I could have made? Well, very simply, that I still feel today that you know, those were the best choices that I could have made based on the information I had available at, at the time. And that's really the ultimate test. So I found this so empowering as a consumer that I formed a company around it and commercialized it. And so uh, uh, shopping websites can add this technology to their site and there's already about half a dozen sites that are using it um, so that you as a consumer can make a literally perfect decision in less than two minutes, even when there are hundreds or even thousands of, of choices. So what if you're the kind of person who just doesn't care that much if they choose the absolutely best TV for them or absolutely best car? Well, there are some reasons why uh, you, know, you still might be uh, interested in, in this particular technology or this type of technology. First is that it works for a whole bunch of things outside of products as well. Basically, any, any decision where you're, you're uh, trying to make a decision based on many criteria, and there are many choices. Things like finding and choosing the best job, university, election candidate. I use this to actually figure out who to vote for in the last federal election. Uh, online dating, whole whack of other things. Secondly, um, there's actually a, a pretty large body of evidence that suggests that uh, uh, the overabundance of choice and the stress that people experience making these decisions is actually a major contributor to anxiety and depression in Western countries. Kind of what, what uh, William was talking about. Um, and probably most importantly, consider that millions of people are going to retire in poverty because they made a bad pension plan decision. And millions more, particularly in the US, aren't going to get needed medications because they chose the wrong drug plan. 
and simple effective decision technology would basically eliminate these problems. So over the course of developing this technology, I also developed some ideas about decision making, which I present as my ideas worth spreading. Not just one, you get three. Uh, the first is that uh, unlike what a lot of experts and scholars uh, believe, I believe that technology can enable people to make perfect preference decisions. Um, but the technology has to understand that these are at their core emotional decisions and that's what's been lacking uh, in the tool so far. Understand as kind of a footnote, I'm talking about preference decisions. There are other types of decisions where I don't know if technology will ever actually be helpful. I think the jury's still out. Um, and uh, secondly, unlike what a lot of people tend to believe, there's no such thing as the best choice objectively speaking. The product that Consumer Reports or CNET says is the top choice is merely the choice that produced the most positive set of emotional responses in the person who wrote that review. That's it, nothing more. And uh, thirdly, uh, consider all the ways in which the world changed when it became effortless to find things on the internet. And imagine how much it's gonna change when it becomes effortless to choose things on the internet. So I wanna wrap up with uh, three hopes that I have for this, this type of technology. The first is that people making better purchase decisions is going to enable them to derive more satisfaction from the products that they do buy, which in turn will lead to less manufacturing waste. The second is that governments will use it to make better procurement decisions, thereby saving billions of dollars of public money every year and enabling that to be put to better use. And as kind of a, an aside, if governments use this, their decisions would also be a lot more transparent, which would in turn uh, reduce corruption. And lastly, I hope the charities will use it. How would a charity use this? Well, charities use a lot of data when making decisions about how to allocate uh, their limited resources. But that data often ends up getting simplified into representations like this, which only shows something like world poverty, for example, according to two dimensions. But obviously, world poverty, or poverty is, is a lot more than a two-dimensional problem. This shows uh, the poorest countries in the world ranked according to 11 dimensions of poverty, and yet it's still very easy to understand which then in turn makes it a lot easier to act on. And uh, in order to uh, encourage charities to use this, I'm announcing actually for the first time at, at this uh, conference that we're gonna be launching a product next year for charities and the technology licenses will be free. Thank you.